much. What a joy to be here with you. You're so blessed to have Bishop Sean leading your children's ministries. You know that, don't you? A wonderful man. Surrounded himself with a remarkable team, and uh, they're doing great, great things. You are blessed to have this leadership over your children's ministries. And I look across here, and I see that I'm in a room full of my heroes. How many of you uh, were children's workers? You teach Sunday school, or you work in a nursery, or you uh, are vacation Bible school or camp? Raise your hands really high. No, no, better still, stand up. Let us give these guys a great round of applause. Okay, that would be okay if this was a soccer game or a basketball game and all they were doing was throwing a ball through a hoop. But these people are changing the world. Let's try this one more time. Kingdom heroes, give them a round of applause. Yeah. For you children's workers, that was called applause. We don't, we don't often hear that noise, those of us who have given our lives in ministry to children, uh, but th that was a very sweet sound. I advise you, children's workers, to get used to that sound because you are going to hear it the minute you walk into heaven. Because in heaven, everyone is going to understand the importance of ministry to children. And when you walk in, you're going to meet one little child that is there because of you, and beside them are going to be 10 friends that they brought because of your ministry, their family, if they're pastors, oh my goodness, there may be dozens of people behind them, and it's all going to have started with your faithfulness. And your joy will be overwhelming. You'll, you'll see what has happened, and you'll say, yeah, praise Jesus. And then you're gonna remember where you are, and you're gonna say, guess he's right over there. Praise you, Jesus. And that's, that applause will go on all through eternity as you begin to understand more and more the people who are there because of your faithfulness. But applause for children's workers down here uh, in this campsite that we're in right now is, is pretty, pretty rare. Not everybody understands the strategic importance of ministry to children. And children's workers don't expect applause. They don't seek it. They don't seek honor. They don't seek recognition. And the people we serve, children, never think to applaud for their heroes. I've traveled the world with Compassion International for 50 years. I have never come across the Children's Hall of Fame where they honor their heroes anywhere in the world. We don't have plattering plaques on our office walls from children. You don't get an honorary doctorate from an elementary school down the road. Children have nothing to give to mobilize politicians and powerful people on their behalf, right? No, no, the truth is they've got all to give. Children are the most generous people in the world. And I can tell you what they give. And those of us who work with them may know. We, they give hugs, arms and leg hugs, full python hugs that say, I love you with all of my might. We get kisses on the cheek, sloppy wet kisses, I know, but it's what the children can give. We get that secret handshake that only children and their heroes know that says, I love you. We get artwork, the work of their hands, the work of their brains, construction paper, string, glitter, glue, way too much glue. <laughs> but those of us who love and believe in children, that's enough, isn't it? I can see from your eyes and I can see from the smiles you do understand that. It's all that we, all that we need. 
And I feel right at home to be with you because I know your heart for children. I've been with you all day. I've been upstairs to the Mystery Island. I have seen uh, Denise and others who are blessing your children. You believe in children. Normally when I'm out speaking, I am having to fight on behalf of ministry to children. I'm often tossing, talking to mission executives or theologians or seminary professors, and I can see from their body language when they understand what we're talking about. They're like, what? We're going to talk about what? Children? And I'm like, yeah. And so I have to give them statistics and strategy and, and scriptures to mobilize them. But looking at you, I realize I don't have to do that. You already get this. This feels kind of like vacation for me. I don't have to convince you of anything, so I'm going to try to encourage you instead. The message briefly this evening would be something like this. The least of these matter most. Throughout history, ever since the disciples shooed the children away from Jesus, the church has behaved with its priorities, with its budget, with its strategies, as if Jesus skipped a word in Matthew 25 when he said, whatever you do for one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. We are behaving as if he said, whatever you've done for one of the least important of these. But he didn't. By least of these, he knew exactly what he was talking about. He meant the poor and the marginalized and the vulnerable, but surely he meant the smallest, the weakest, the youngest among us. Those who are least able to speak for themselves, least able to protect themselves, least able to care for themselves. What you've done for, for, for the least of these, he's saying, is for those who can't thank you, those who can't reward you, those who can't honor you. Then, mysteriously and wonderfully, Jesus is saying, that was me. Not for me, not on my behalf. Literally, that was me. Your cup of cold water quenched my thirsty throat. Teacher, that little boy that you would not give up on, Jesus would say, that was me. Officer, that little girl that you protected was me. The tears you brushed from that little cheek, Jesus would say, were my tears. And I felt that much needed hug. Matthew 25, 40, that's a judgment day that's being described and it's coming. It's red letters in my Bible. One trumpet blast from now, the skies are going to open up and we're gonna go home and everybody's gonna understand what was important in the priorities of the kingdom of God. There's gonna be great surprises in that day. Gonna be surprising who was important and who wasn't important. We're in for a surprise on what was important and what wasn't important. Then we are all going to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, this upside down kingdom in which we are citizens while we temporarily inhabit this earth. We will fully understand how the first can be last and the last can be first. We will understand how the weak can be strong and the strong weak. We'll understand how the poor can be rich and the rich often poor. We'll understand that the servant is the greatest, surrenders what leads to victory. And in the kingdom of our God, the little are big. The least of these matter most. And all of those, all of you who bless them, you touch the very heart of God. And one trumpet blast from now, you will understand that. I love the story of Dwight L. Moody, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, one of the schools I went to back in the 1800s. Close your eyes and listen to this little brief story and see what you, what you picture. The story is told that D.L. Moody climbed into bed after an evangelistic service one evening and his wife, Emma, who apparently didn't go that night, uh, rolled over and she said, well, Dwight, how did it go tonight? And he said, pretty good, Emma. Two and a half converts. Emma thought for a minute, she says, that's a, that's a cute way to say it. How old was the child? And he said, no, no, Emma, it was two children and one adult. 
The children have their whole lives in front of them. It's the adult who is half gone. D.L. Moody led a million people to Christ in his time, and on his deathbed, he said, if I had my life to live over again, I would dedicate it entirely in ministry to children. He was one of us. He understood the harvest that we are so all eager about reaching. Picture the harvest. We we're talking about reconciling this world to God all this week. Think about that world, though, this picture of the sea of humanity standing before our Lord in this moment in Matthew 25. When you picture the people of the world, what do you see? Guys, if every other person in that mental image is not a child, we don't know what the harvest looks like. Our world is now half children. And not only are they children, it is in childhood is the prime time, as D.L. Moody knew, to bring them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. 85% of people around the world who give their lives to Christ do it while they are children. Line up 10 people who've given their lives to Christ and ask them, when did you do that? And at least eight of them will say, when I was a child between the ages of four and 14. Let me do a little missiological research here. How many of you would say, that was me? At that age, between 4 and 14, I gave my life to Christ. Raise your hands high. Oh my goodness, it holds up true here. I'm not a rocket scientist, but if that's the case, wouldn't you think that missions would be honed in on children? No, it's a very rare mission organization that spends more than 15% of its effort on reaching children for Christ. It's a rare church that spends more than that. I don't know about you, but we will not bring in the kingdom without a paradigm shift. We've got to think and feel differently. In my book, Too Small to Ignore, I make the case that ministry to children is often the great omission in the great commission. How can this be? How can we get so far from God's heart in our priorities? And I did a little research. I wondered, is it because there's not enough children? No, uh, they are half of the world. Are they unimportant or only half as important because they're only half our size? Uh, I don't think so. My five-foot wife can make quite a case why size has nothing to do with importance. Is God somehow silent um, about their, uh, their place in the kingdom? I don't think so. He says, train up a child. He said, let those children come to me forcefully. He said, don't you dare cause one of them to stumble. You'd be better off with a two-ton rock around your neck thrown into the sea. Maybe it's all too complicated. More of us need to get PhDs in this child development field. I don't think so. As I look across this audience, I'm thinking everybody I see is an expert. You all deserve honorary doctorates. Let me double check. How many of you have ever been a child? Yeah, uh -huh, that's what I thought. Everybody I ever met either is a child or was a child. We don't need to know anything more. We know what we need to know. What about God's view of children? You saw them up here. We are chosen. Did you hear him say that profound thought? We are chosen. You go through the scriptures, almost any time a child is mentioned, God is up to something important, probably something too important to entrust to a grown-up, as if he says, whoa, this is really big. I need someone really small. Because he loves them, he believes in them, he respects them, and he uses them. Go through scripture very quickly, you know the stories. When what was needed to kill an evil giant that was ridiculing the people of God, you would think, well, what was needed is military might. But no, God said, no, 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 no. What's needed is faith. And he chose a little boy named David. When God could not speak to his high priest because he was too distant, God chose a little boy to speak into Eli's mind and heart. He chose a little Samuel. 
And God didn't say, well, he's just a little boy, Samuel. Give me, give him a simple message. Eli, please be good. God loves you. Please be good. No, Samuel gave Eli his pink slip. He said, you and your sons are finished. And God could entrust a powerful message like that to a child because he needed a pure, clear channel. Jesus taught it when he was 12 years old in the temple, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus could have snapped his fingers, fed everybody, and gone on with the talk. Instead, he waited for a little boy. And a little boy came forward with his five loaves and two fish. He could have said, excuse me, but I'm the only one smart enough to have brought his lunch, apparently. I got five loaves and two fish. You can have one fish and a couple loaves. That seems fair to me, right? That's what a grown-up would say. But this little boy must have said, Jesus, what if I gave you everything I have? Would that be enough? And I believe God, Jesus, I believe he did that miracle for that little boy whose name we don't even know. Problem with us grown-ups is we think too much, or we know too much, or the big problem is we think we know too much. <laughs> and God often goes right straight to the children. So how can they be such a second-rate mandate? How can they miss out on the Great Commission? I maintain that it may be because they're easy to forget, they're easy to ignore, they're powerless, they have no resources, they have no voice to mobilize politicians. They're unorganized. I mean, really, look at their rooms. You know they're unorganized. Every segment of society has learned how to lobby and fight for their own cause, except children. Have you ever seen a children's protest march? No, neither have I. But I'm here to tell you that if they could speak on their own behalf, they would have much to say about this society, this world that we're living in, because they are paying the greatest price for everything that goes wrong in society. It spirals downward, and it lands on the heads of our most innocent citizens. Our sins of commission, doing the things that we know we shouldn't do, children pay the greatest price. War, prostitution, pornography, all at their worst side is child. Our sins of omission, not doing the things that we know we should do, Again, children pay the price on our unhappy homes, neglect, missed hugs, lack of encouragement, lack of prayer, and they carry these scars for life. The worst omission is knowing all this is going on and doing nothing about it. It's been said all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And I've observed that good people do nothing for only two reasons. They don't know who to trust and they don't know what to do. Albert Einstein said, the world's a dangerous place, not because of the people who do evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. I have become convinced after 45 years of working on behalf of children that the reason they are a second-rate mandate to many of us, the reason that they are left behind is that it is spiritual warfare we are up against. I am convinced that over our heads, although the church and the government and missions don't often think children are all that important. There are two entities in our universe that think they are extremely important, and that is the hosts of heaven and the hordes of hell. There's a battle fought over our heads over each and every child. Satan delighting when they are destroyed and when they are pushed away from Jesus. But all of heaven stands and rejoices and welcomes every little child when they come into the kingdom. You see why I love you guys? You see why I am so excited about who you are, what these remarkable leaders are doing? Because your cause is my cause. It's my mission. It's my battle. And I wonder, where are your hearts today? This world is a harsh, exhausting place. Is bringing children to a relationship with Christ still an incredibly high priority for you? Does it move you deeply? Does it deserve your time and your talent and your treasure? Can it move you still to tears, 
tears of sorrow at the tragic need to be addressed, or tears of great joy at the, at, at the victories in the midst of it? If not, I beg you, don't live like that. We don't have enough time for you to be living like that. If God stands a child in front of you for even one minute, it's a divine appointment. And you might be the one that says the right thing, does the right thing, that brings them in to the kingdom of God. So my prayer for you as I close is the same as the prayer for myself, that God will give you renewed strength, courage, and love for your sacred calling, and that you will return to your little ones full of joy and hope and vision, and that you will throw yourself into that ministry again. And in the midst of that hug, in the midst of that prayer, in the midst of that Sunday school lesson, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when you least expect it, Scripture says, a trumpet blast, and you will look up and the sky will roll back like a scroll, and we will go home, finally, finally home. Home where there's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more hunger, no more suffering. Home where we belong. Not even any tears. We're told in Revelation 21, 4, God says, I, I myself will wipe the last tears from their eyes. Think about that. The hands that knit you in your mama's womb are waiting to wipe the tears from your eyes. Think about it. The hands that picked you up when you fell down and just didn't have the strength and courage to go on, those hands who love you so much and felt all of your pain are waiting to wipe the tears from your eyes. The hands that spread out on the cross and took those nails to redeem you are waiting, those same hands, to wipe the tears from your eyes. And I don't know about you, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to run into the arms of my Lord, my Savior, my King, my Redeemer. <laughs> and I cannot wait for Him to wipe the tears from my eyes. But oh, my prayer for you is this. As He wipes the tears from our eyes, He notices, hmm, I got to wipe the sweat off His brow too. Because this guy fought all the way. He lived the life that I called him to live. You spoke up for those who couldn't speak for themselves. You were kind to the least of these until you were wonderfully and suddenly interrupted by heaven. Oh, may that be the prayer for you. May it be the prayer for me. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.